But Max, over to you. Thank you very much. And as we have a very interesting group of panelists, and you've already heard from me, I'm going to move directly into the panel. Um, we heard who our uh, panelists are, so I won't go into uh, introductions, but I'll move uh, very quickly into what are some of the questions that we wanted to discuss. And the first was, um, to each of you, where do you see the very high potential use case of blockchain in your area? Where could it take off first, and where would you, how to say, bet your money on this? Yeah, thank you. So my name is Dennis. I'm coming from Central Bank. As you know, uh, Latvia, Latvia's Banka is not a regulatory and competent authority in Latvia. Nevertheless, uh, many of you know me, and uh, there is no doubt for me personally that central banks to play a role, and especially having such a passionate experts to play a role in, uh, in facilitating innovation and development. Well, my, my focus and my profile is payments, payment systems. Nevertheless, yeah, sure, uh, blockchain goes far beyond. But uh, at least by now, we, we actively act as a, as a catalyst and, uh, and we facilitate and, and organize discussions on, on, on the matter. Well, uh, as regards to uh, different areas, I would say we should, we should separate two things. For, for central banks and for every public authority, then if we take our internal use cases, then I should say we do not use uh, currently blockchain in our process, nevertheless. We actively participate in uh, joint projects of other European central banks uh, and ECB. We actively test technology. Uh, we also have hackathons, so central banks also have hackathons. And, uh, well, so far, uh, it has not proved to be safer, cheaper, uh, and, and more efficient for payments. As you know, payments in euro are very, uh, very fast and very cheap. So in Latvia, we call them zip maximum. I would like to highlight this again. And uh, that's, that's really great uh, achievement. But nevertheless, uh, area of securities. Uh, securities lending, collateral management seems to be quite promising. So it's one of basic functions for central banks and, and probably after some testing we find that uh, blockchain could be adopted for such kind of infrastructures. There is a lot of speculation about so-called digital based money, what ECB is actively speaking about, but I would say it's too early to, to speak about, to discuss this topic. We'll see. Analysis uh, and, and uh, some work is ongoing with an ECB. Maybe uh, in the near future we will come uh, with interesting conclusions on, on that particular topic. And there is another aspect. Indeed, as a public authority, we can actively work in order to facilitate adoption of the technology in Latvia. And uh, I think uh, work is uh, going quite well, intensively in Latvia, and, and uh, we are going into the right direction. We hold one seminar, which was uh, well attended at the end of, of last year. We came to understand where we stand, what is the potential of this technology, it was rather interesting, and I would say that uh, different ministries and, and agencies are quite active, and they have quite experienced and, and competent experts. And moving north to Estonia, to the Estonian Cryptocurrency Association, uh, Mr. Rasi Sauga. Thank you. It's really nice to be here. Uh, yep, my name is Rasi Sauga. Uh, my background is IT, uh, Ministry of Finance and LGB Bank, and now I'm more freelancer and investor, thanks to the cryptocurrencies, <laughs> <laughs> mostly. And... Um, yeah, uh, about the use cases, uh, well, the money itself uh, is a really, really good use case. It just needs uh, some more time to evolve, but, uh, but definitely the first and major use case of, uh, of the blockchain is, is uh, cryptocurrencies. Then, um, of course, the, 
uh, development platforms and smart contract field is really, really great and, uh, and lots of potential are there. What I'm seeing, the, uh, maybe the first, well, the ICO's money raising uh, technologies uh, have uh, disrupted already by the blockchain technology. Next wave probably will come uh, from uh, markets, from a trading part where the decentralized exchanges and uh, off-chain challenges will play a major role. And uh, near future, we, we see uh, really, really uh, big changes in the liquidity markets, in the cryptocurrency markets. Um, that will be uh, one big field what you, what you monitor. And, uh, and then, of course, different uh, decentralized identity technologies uh, which are developed in different parts of the world. Um, yeah, and more widely, like smart content technologies. That's, that's already quite a bit. And uh, so now moving to uh, Janis Graubinsch, who's uh, both at the EU level, a member of the working party of the Blockchain Forum and Observatory, and co-founder at Notaki here in Latvia. Yeah, thank you. Um, my background is uh, that I established companies that deals with cybersecurity. And actually, the two points which I mentioned was just what my colleague said. So first of all, as I have been dealing with a lot of cybersecurity, I think digital identity is something uh, what has great potential. Uh, in specifics, uh, where we see unsolved problem, what a blockchain technology can help is for e-voting, because in many member states, uh, this has been a problem because uh, there hasn't been a way to create systems which are secure enough for the government. Uh, but the blockchain technology, as it is now, we have seen already like proof of concepts that on a small level, uh, it, as a technology using zero knowledge proofs, can be used for e-voting. For instance, there's a case in UK, uh, I think it was in Oxford University, where they tested out and it worked on the small scale. So I think that there should be more and more such use cases. And if, if we think like from the EU level, like there has been this all the time, this problem that, that people are not very politically active. And on a, on a one way, it's, it's also because this process is very long. You have to go to the voting booth and, uh, and it's not very convenient. If we can use blockchain technology, we actually could make the e-voting more often. So people also would engage politically more often there as well. And another thing where I see this great potential, which just my colleague mentioned, is uh, ICO as a, as a fundraising mechanism. So there I see actually two like, great benefits. So one is that like, it allows uh, like local, really, really small companies to attract funding. For instance, like, uh, like a pizza shop. It's your neighbor pizza shop. You want to support it. You want to buy the shares. And uh, through blockchain technology, you could do that, actually. You would receive a token, which corresponds to a share and you would support that. You would know that maybe that pizza shop will not be like Papa John's, but that may be actually good because we, we all know what's happening now with Papa John's. Uh, but, but nevertheless, if we can support these local businesses, local bakeries, butchers, then actually the environment around us becomes more vibrant, it becomes more secure, and we uh, boost the eco economy around us. And the second thing, uh, very short, what I mentioned, is that it's also very great for uh, illiquid assets, making it liquid, such as like infrastructure projects, for instance, where, which uh, typically have problems attracting funding. Uh, so there I see that uh, using ICOs, it can help a lot. Okay, and uh, going a little bit different than the... Uh, the uh Order of the pictures. Now we have <laughs> Lev Bas from the member of the board of the Blockchain Development Association here in Latvia. Uh, yeah, hi everyone. Uh, so, Yanis, thank you very much. You kind of underlined everything that we should have talked about <laughs> right now. Uh, but actually, yes, Yanis got a really good point uh, regarding e voting. Uh, something you don't know Ukraine just uh, yesterday announced that they have partnered with NAM Crypto, which oh, uh, to first of all test e voting and then implement it 
for the whole Ukraine. Ukraine now, as everybody knows, are in distress and blockchain actually will help it, first of all, to reach people living in uh, excluded regions. Also, uh, to combine uh, a transparent and uh, legal voting uh, for, for everybody who, who lives in Ukraine and outside it. Uh, also, I have a kind of personal visions of so-called fit model, which which includes uh, which underlines what blockchain actually could help in. Uh, fit stands for uh, fraud intermediaries and throughput. Uh, fraud being uh, industries where there is a high chance of fraud. Uh, intermediaries, obviously, where uh, there are multiple stages of a uh, single process, which uh, adds additional cost to the process, like, uh, for example, supply chain management. Uh, uh, and also throughput means where, is, where there is a high amount of uh, similar tax, tasks that are being done again and again and again. And uh, for that one, the medical records, uh, e-health care systems within, within the government. Thank okay. You. Very good. And now we move on to uh, Alexander Zelinsky and to the UK, member of the board of Velvet uh, Finance Limited. Yeah. Yours. Good, good morning, everyone. From our side, we <clears throat> work in the field of uh, making online deals more secure and more transparent. And actually, we are working on first uh, blockchain powered escrow platform for any online deals. And from our perspective, we see possibilities for blockchain technology in three different fields. So first would be a changing of paradigm when people are going to offline stores, to offline enterprises and offline uh, government services and moving from offline to online. And with that, there is two more questions. So first is anonymization in the internet. So that's kind of being one of the biggest troubles out there that you usually don't know which is a second party in your deal uh, from another side and most likely it's even in another country so then you have not a lot of options how to how to make real secure deal online and second question would be uh, as well uh, trust building uh, questions because if you go to online then one of the first questions would be how can I trust second party? And for that we actually see implementation of blockchain technology in terms of timestamping of everything that goes inside or outside of our system, automation of all processes uh, related to deal flow, uh, as well as smart contract systems as my colleagues mentioned earlier, uh, which actually means that uh, with preventing of all major uh, online issues which you have, like uh, lack of identification, never knowing what's going on, and uh, pretty high fees on international transfers as well in different currencies, uh, you can ensure that you have one secure platform for all this. Hey, Justinus, uh, uh, we, we already heard from you, but from the open banking pilot platforms, is there anything that you would want to, you would want to add? Uh, maybe the, um, about the use cases, the real one. Um, what we started to look, yes, blockchain, uh, it could be like used uh, internally into the company, let's say for some, I don't know, to change some processes or something like to improve. But uh, as we are looking uh, for those cases, I think it's uh, the most relevant one uh, in order to adopt the technology and to spread it, uh, not just in one company, but uh, I don't know, country-wise or, or politically wise So those use cases uh, where they require some data exchange or share the data between uh, some uh, financial institutions, what I mentioned already, here we see. Uh, it could be like, uh, uh, as well, this alias um, uh, already presented like a uh, um, use case. But as well, it can be like uh, additional one uh, related to government uh, like services. It can be, or I believe that it's uh, very, uh, it could be like useful uh, mm, to have the real time uh, information about the um, 
company registry uh, information and updates about representatives and etc. So um, from use cases perspective, I think there's like a long uh, list of them. There are many of them, but just uh, I need to check uh, what is the most important. Uh, start from a small step, try, and then adopt this and continue, continue and like expand this. Because if you will try with one, I believe it will uh, change uh, a lot, yeah. Very good. So, I mean, in relation to the use cases that you've mentioned or, or other ones without going too broadly, I mean, as you was just mentioning, um, what do you see each of you as the main barrier or the main barriers to go to implementation? And do you see something specific that the national governments, associations of banks, others, the European Union institutions such as the European Commission can do to, to bring down such barriers? Dennis. We have heard already a list of good ideas and uh, well, the question is why we do not use them already in real life. And uh, the first uh, conclusion for me, and it was quite surprising uh, to, to, to understand this uh, last December was that one of the major barriers is a lack of competence, of IT competence, because we have uh, quite good ideas, uh, but uh, it's rather difficult to get to the step of preparing technical specifications and start practical work, because uh, blockchain logic, uh, it's a quite specific uh, Thing, uh, I would say, and, and, and therefore this IT competence is very important. I would also um, uh, highlight, well, from the Latvian perspective, I must say that uh, I would expect more passionate private sector. In my opinion, it's not passionate enough. Well, if I would say we do not have such a big banks or big bank, um, branches of big banking groups here, now uh, comparing to the euro, but still almost every day I read about kind of startup coming with a new idea, implementing a new blockchain-based solution. And, and so uh, from Latvia, well, the number is quite, quite close to zero. So I would expect more. And one more argument uh, to support this, oh, well, our investment and development agency uh, started a discussion with, uh, with the private sector, with the industry, about market-driven proof of concept. But so far, I know that there is no progress in that. Therefore, I would expect more, more passionate fintechs and startups there. Well, one more thing, uh, quite complicated one, is uh, still unclarity about uh, privacy. Yeah, we have already touched this topic. So for financial sector, for banking community, it's quite important to keep your data safe. If all the data is available on blockchain, how to ensure that actually each peer receives only that information he should be able to see. And um, uh, quite important one that uh, you, Petr, has already touched uh, is uh, standardization and interoperability. And we have also faced the problem that there is a, at least three topical platform, IBM, Hyperledger, Ethereum, Corda. Well, what is the best one? When I try something on one, then I need to start at least from the beginning on another one. Well, they be interoperable. So for bank or other financial institution, what will be the right choice? And uh, this is quite important thing. I, I know that you have probably this on your agenda that, uh, well, you do not include that in the near future you will need to step in to, to, to put more resource on monitoring uh, progress in member states and, and probably to come with a kind of guidelines or, or some, some standardization initiatives in, in that area. Well, it will be definitely uh, very welcome, in my opinion. Last but not least, uh, I would like to say that uh, here in Latvia, uh, as I already told, uh, public authorities are quite active, uh, working on, uh, on, on uh, virtual currencies topic, trying to provide that clarity you already highlighted. Yeah, definitely, if you want to support this industry, we need to start with the clarity. 
legal clarity. And there was a working group of experts, virtual currency experts, a uh, working group created by the decree of uh, Prime Minister. The working group has already delivered its report with a recommendation to the government. So uh, I hope that during August, ministers will, will go through. There are also a list of uh, outcomes, follow-ups for, for each authority. And as well, uh, there was indeed a part uh, about the blockchain as a technology behind virtual currencies. And uh, some of you were also working together with me on, on, on this particular part of report. And well, we concluded and, and, and we actually invite government to create a special ex experts working group who will deal with this, who will prepare uh, ways or scenarios or proposals for the government how to facilitate the use and the adoption of the technology both for, to support your initiative and, and indeed to support adoption of the technology in the public and, and, and financial sector in, in Latvia as well. Okay, so questions and recommendations noted by the European Commission now coming from ASE from the uh, Estonian Cryptocurrency uh, Association. Sorry, I didn't think. What, what, uh, what barriers oh. do you see and what can be done by, by who to uh, address them? Yeah, uh, well, yeah, one of the barriers definitely is, uh, is lack of knowledge, knowledge. Uh, education and spreading the information is the best, uh, uh, best solution here. But um, even like, uh, the, to be honest, the technology itself is quite young uh, as well as uh, if you compare it um, I would believe that uh, the blockchain technology is at least same importance like radio waves, for example. And if, you, if we look uh, into history, then uh, radio waves uh, from the first use case to the mass adoption, uh, it took like 50 years at least. Uh, so in terms of blockchain technology, we are still in a uh, in really early stage. And, um, and even more widely, uh, uh, the technology is there, but, uh, but the most difficult part is to understand the potential, understand uh, disruption, what the technology uh, will have been made and will made. It involves uh, uh, even uh, like uh, how, how the organizations are working together because it, it supports mostly like community-based organizations and activities. It doesn't work uh, so well together with the traditional companies and traditional way of, of uh, doing business because yeah, it's, it's much more like community-based uh, technology and, uh, and uh, it, uh, it challenges people to, to rethink the values, uh, to focus more to the transparency, to the trust and um, yeah, it's more like uh, rethinking the attitudes, how, how we are doing things, how we're doing the business, and understanding about that. Uh, Jani, from a, from a startup here in Latvia. <laughs> uh, yes, thank you. Uh, I will mention like uh, two things each about uh, what I have been talking about. So about digital identity, uh, this is something what we have been talking a lot in EU Blockchain Observatory as well. And one of the biggest challenges is uh, GDPR compliance because uh, if you put something on the public blockchain, it's public, but then the GDPR is coming up with the terms that the user ha has to be able to uh, delete uh, he, uh, the information. He uh, must know where the information is stored. And uh, when uh, we look how the public blockchains work, then how can you like uh, know all the like uh, miners, for instance, who write the information in the blockchain uh, how, how can you make a solution that actually works on such a scale? So what we have come up that now the best solution in order if you want to work with the public blockchains is that instead of putting the uh, sensitive private information on the chain, you just put like proofs, let's say, that this address, uh, it's, it's uh, more than 18 years or uh, whatever information you need without uh, saying the information and identifying the person. So there's actually a solution how you can do that on the public blockchain. 
And I think that's in a way it's a challenge, but I think that it can be solved like that. And regarding the ICOs, I think um, that comes together like how different uh, like EU countries are approaching this. Some countries are saying, okay, so we will consider ICOs and IPOs. But if a company wants to raise a small amount of money, it doesn't make sense because all these uh, legal paperwork, it would cost so much that it's not actually a solution. So as we have seen, a great uh, initiative comes actually from the EU. It's uh, called crowdfunding uh, regulation. And I have heard that there has been also considerations that ICOs could be included into that paper. So if, it's, if, if it will be included, actually that will greatly benefit the companies who want to raise money. Thank okay, you. Uh, Lev. Yeah, so uh, as, as an association, we have uh, been through a lot of uh, meeting work groups, uh, seminars, hackathons with the government officials, with the uh, Bank of Latvia, with Ministry of Economics, uh, with the Ministry of Healthcare as well, and with the Latvian Investment Development Agency. And uh, we are very grateful for, for a huge support and interest in this uh, in our field, and uh, we we would like them to be more open and uh, forward thinking in terms of how blockchain technology have ha can be adopted. As my colleague from Estonian Association already mentioned, that uh, we make things differently than uh, everybody else is. Uh, is prepared to work and uh, if you want our technology you should uh, apply to our rules and uh, invite us to work with you as the European Commission is doing right now and we, we are very supportive and uh, willing to offer our knowledge and experience. Great, so thank you. Nice to, he nice to hear that as well. And now moving to Alexander. Yeah, from our perspective I would say that one of the first uh, blocking uh, points why this technology is not going very fast, if you speak about Latvia specifically, uh, would be decentralization of different databases in country. To this moment, uh, we, if we take example of, let's say, Estonian colleagues, they have governmental approach from 1992 that if you have data in one place already, why should you ask for same data once again? So that's one. and. Uh, there is another example that like Lithuania did already like, almost 10 years ago when they created official state registry organization which is responsible for all the registries. And then only based on different projects you ask for permission to access one or another registry, but still it's one organization to deal with. Not as in Latvia we have, I would say, each ministry have multiple databases and when you want to create different uh, kind of transparency uh, based solutions, then you need to deal not only with one organization, but with five different. And usually they are not really friendly with each other. So I would say that yeah, first is bureaucratical barriers, second is uh, complexity of different databases and not uh, consist one place where to go, and third would be a kind of political wish or unwilling to, to go this direction. And so the reference to the once only principle from Estonia, which we're applying now in also EU, e-government initiatives, and this is an area where blockchain and actually help in its design, obviously a perhaps more modern blockchain in reaching the goals that the legislators are, are setting out. And Justina, so you're going to get the, the last word in this discussion before we move to the questions from the audience. So what do you see as the barriers? Okay, already it's mentioned about um, lack of um, regulation or clarity or uncer because there is uncertainty in uh, regulation like, uh, and, and to understand how to uh, treat uh, one or another thing because uh, in Baltic's law there is no like uh, clear explanation or based on uh, like look, looking from blockchain uh, perspective and so, somehow regulation on that, uh, opinion on that. Uh, neither in Europe, uh, European authorities, there is also no 
uh, currently, at current moment, no uh, guidelines uh, for the blockchain itself. So I hope, let's say, from uh, European uh, authorities uh, that will be uh, taking this action and at least like to formalize uh, uh, some guidelines uh, how to treat this uh, new technology. I know that there is a big list uh, in front of uh, some, some uh, commissions and, and etc. Uh, who are waiting uh, uh, as well. Uh, like, like to explain and to uh, give the opinion, but still, now if you want like to uh, make something real, uh, really need uh, to take away this uncertainty in the regulation, especially from uh, data protection. I think uh, companies, uh, uh, small and big, uh, uh, are afraid of uh, mistake uh, because we know uh, what can be like uh, as a result of that. So. Uh, I don't think uh, that, uh, let's say, current uh, lawyers or the offices like, uh, are not smart enough. They are. Uh, we got uh, really good like, consultations, uh, etc. But we see that uh, from uh, European uh, this uh, regulation, there is like, a lack uh, or specification onto the blockchain. So this is the aim. Okay, note, note, note taken, though I can already indicate on the Blockchain Observatory and Forum website, you can both find a thematic report on GDPR and blockchain, general data protection regulation and blockchain, and, and a video, and there's more work coming now. Uh, one thing I will also note that it's not just blockchain, it's also big data, it's artificial intelligence. All the decentralized, and I think maybe hopefully using the word correctly, decentralized technologies differ a little bit from the way that the GDPR was written. It was written for the digital world, but a little bit more looking at the siloed storage of data. But actually the spirit fits very much with blockchain. It's the user controlling his or her data, and we're thinking very much, especially smart contracts, can allow data in the blockchain 2.0, in the blockchain 3.0 to be, to be utilized. That's why on the public sector side, we're making this push and this, this demand for, for the purchase. But I mean, this is a debate, analysis, and technology development that is something very much underway and hopefully going towards fruition and hopefully with uh, very good results in Europe. Now, maybe most importantly, I still can be uh, happy as moderator that we have about uh, 10 minutes to take questions from the audience? Yes, so um, is there another microphone? Or I'm happy to have some. A microphone is coming. Thank you, gentlemen. A very worthwhile discussion. I just wanted to make one feedback because in, in this composition you might not come, you know, anytime soon, maybe together. So what really, uh, I work on many, you know, capital markets projects and just some feedback, you know, what is really, you know, an op both an opportunity and what is lacking, you know, in terms of supporting companies going into stock exchange and what technology could help them and after they go into the stock exchange. For instance, a fantastic opportunity for a distributed ledger technology would be like shareholders meetings, you know, from a distance, right? So this, uh, so we, we still have these, yeah, so we, we, we still have these, you know, physical meetings, but, but how much, you know, dynamic it would be if that was, you know, possibility to participate, identify, participate from a distance and on a, you know, a trusted software, right? So that's one thing. Another thing is definitely, you know, uh, also when you go to a, st um, in, in a stock market, you also you need to do this, you know, allocation and book building of, of your shares, yes? And sometimes when it is a private placement process or not, or, or you know, any kind of placement process, if you use a totally trustable software, also it increases the confidence uh, from the investors. And third area, which I noted uh, actually from the practice is you know also one very uh, a couple of good peer to peer platforms and they're considering actually going into the uh, also into the regulated market into the stock exchange but what what really lacks is again a, a both a legal and a technical link how to they have good clients real clients you know qualifying clients european union residents but they do not want to open these local securities accounts. Let's say it, it's a big it's a big process. But then a possibility to connect these good qualifying clients with custodian on the based again on a secure controllable platform. I mean that's that's just a feedback from the market and um, 
And thank you very much. Let's maybe take uh, two, two or three questions and see if there's anyone else. And while the microphone is traveling, I'll just say, and also answer to one of the comments, I mean, we're not going to have a regulation on blockchain. We don't regulate technologies, like there's not a regulation on transistors or on servers, etc. But things like uh, that perhaps could be characteristic of decentralized approaches like smart contracts, ICOs, making it possible to register a transaction in different ways without locking us into blockchain. This is all on the table and your inputs are, are hoped for. And the floor is yours. Hi. So uh, one other feedback from a fintech perspective because I'm running a fintech startup on blockchain. So uh, for regulators or authorities, uh, when we approach in different um, parts of the Europe, including UK, um, I would like to see them keep less emphasis on virtual currencies or on cryptocurrencies when we talk about blockchain, rather than thinking on the innovation part. Because uh, it has happened that if you are a regulator and you haven't seen something uh, in your life to, as a test case, and you don't know about it, and I'm talking about it, you come to a conclusion too fast. So it would be advisable for regulators or authorities to think about a solution if, if a startup or a fintech SME is coming and giving you any idea of developing something new, which you may not have seen. Give it a time uh, between your group and think about it before coming to the conclusion too early. And don't only think about virtual or digital currencies when somebody talks about blockchain. Okay, so that's more, more, more a comment, but I mean, I think a, a valuable one. And then perhaps let's collect a, a last question and then we move to the panelists. Yeah, uh, um, my name is Lila Medin. I'm from the Ministry of Justice, so it's more from the public sector opinion. And actually, why I wanted to kind of raise a question was the reaction of the Lithuanian colleague who talked about the lack of regulation. Uh, actually, for the last half a year or so, I have been thinking that the legislator will never manage to catch the speed of the development of technology. The, it has a certain procedures in parliament and government in the EU, and I think it's more the way what was mentioned by Maris, that we have to take our current laws and think of their interpretation, rather than keep changing them, because then we complain on the other side, the laws are changing too often, and we cannot uh, just follow what's written in the laws and regulations. So my thought is more of thinking that perhaps it's easier to have a interpretation of current laws, kind of guidance, putting things together, because soft guidance is it's more of the consensus of both parties, the regulator, the public sector, and private, rather than by the time the law will go to parliament for the third reading, it will be already outdated. And probably the parliamentarians in their political deal will make some mistakes in any case. You will not be happy at the end of the day. So that's more of possibly also some uh, modern thinking of what is the legislator's role in all that thing. Oh, uh, yeah. Yep, I totally agree that uh, regulations are really slow compared to real uh, development uh, uh, schedule in, in the blockchain field and, and uh, more widely techno technology field. And, uh, and even uh, this, the speed of the development will grow exponentially as more and more really wise uh, people are coming into, the, into that uh, technology. And, but to be honest, actually the blockchain, uh, my, my belief is that the blockchain doesn't need regulation uh, because many reasons. It has, first of all, it has uh, a lot of self-regulation already built in so that actors can't act wrongly there because of the punishment methods and the different incentives, uh, which are all cryptographically uh, protected. So yeah, there is uh, they can to, to minimize there is uh, created the situation where is the minimized way of of creating uh, false transactions or or attacks and. Um, and if you, if you look a little bit uh, back to the history, then uh, current, uh, we can probably say that the current two main success stories uh, regarding the blockchain technology are hardware development uh, because of the miners' incentive, uh, because of the incentive to mine uh, currencies. There, is a, there are huge uh, uh, evolve of, uh, of hardware development 
before the blockchain was the gaming industry, major driver of that now is the mining industry. And uh, another success story is uh, disruption of uh, fundraising ICOs. And they both are working really well. Uh, well, the ICOs, so there are some, uh, some improvements, of course, but the market uh, uh, have been regulated by himself really well still. Uh, and, uh, and they both are really good success stories. And the and, uh, interesting thing is that they both have done it without any regulations. And uh, yeah, let's see what the future brings. Any other comments or questions to the other panels? Yeah, I, I also would like, would like to comment on, uh, on the note that uh, regulations are being slow to adapt to upcoming technology. Yes, on one point, that's true. On the second point, regulators, uh, people who are uh, responsible for uh, adopting and accepting those are slow themselves. Don't you think that uh, the whole industry must innovate because the regulations are accepted kind of 93 BC? And I mean the date of the year, 93 BC, where uh, we could actually digitalize the voting system on the certain regulation that would be also be helpful and speed up the process. Uh, to Latvian Ministry of Justice, uh, last time I checked, I needed to physically be present at our at my notary to sign a translated document by hand. That's changed. Why? That's already changed. Yeah. From first yeah. of July, that's changed. Already. Okay. Yeah, that's first of July in twenty first century. <laughs> yeah, well, but still. Thank you. Other comments or, or last words in the panel? Well, if you allow, briefly reflect on that, um, you know, to protect regulators and competent authorities. Well, we are developing. We are adapting. Uh, Central Bank, for example, is extending scope, covering now not only, for example, market participants, but ecosystems, uh, uh, new different approaches, fintechs, blockchain, as you see, virtual currencies, and so on and so on. Therefore, um, this is indeed logical way. We can go for sandboxes. We should move from laws to even not to standards, but maybe to requirements or for standards guidelines. Yeah, flexible, efficient, fast, but maybe a bit soft uh, instruments uh, to regulate this. And uh, as 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 um, I already said, well. There are many use cases where you really do not need any kind of regulation. But still, for some, for smart contracts, for example, you really need this legal certainty and to understand uh, has it legal power or not. On that, I can also already make you happy that we're analyzing very seriously and taking into account the inputs from the field, from uh, the industry. And though obviously you have the attitude that you could just leave it as code and code is code, it works. But a lot of people do seem to have the great interest that it would have also a legally binding aspect, not only just be code that uh, enacts something automatically. So we're looking into this, but as I say, this would be into the, the next college, the next commission. So any other last comments or, or questions? Or uh, in that case, we can uh, close the panel uh, on time or even slightly early. Or Sandra, do you have a, a last question for any of us? Um, I actually think uh, the, the one topic uh, that would be good to touch upon is the e-identity that Yanis uh, was talking a number of times. And uh, we know that... Uh, uh, after almost a year, one and a half year of uh, exploring the discussion in the Nordics, uh, five uh, biggest Nordic financial institutions have agreed to work together in creating a KYC utility, something that we've uh, been trying uh, from the association side to uh, launch into a discussion mode here in Latvia as well. And most likely we will be um, delving deeper in the fall as currently with the new sanctions law coming in the force, we actually see quite a demand from the corporate sector to help ease the compliance uh, requirements beyond the financial industry. So any 
as these are the systems that anywhere in Europe uh, or globally, whether Singapore, Hong Kong, uh, Luxembourg, Nordics are being built anew, what would be your advice on how to think about these, uh, which is a lot about the interconnection of the various registers and being able to retrieve uh, the data by many, many participants on the market? Comments. Okay, I can uh, comment a little bit from my experience. Uh, I have experience that we've worked with Swiss banks uh, developing EID solutions there. And the most common problem which we saw was that these actually banks, they don't trust each other. So it will be interesting to see how it will develop in Nordics, uh, if they will be able actually to build a solution uh, that goes into production, not only like a proof of concept. Uh, because when it comes to the owner of the platform, uh, when it comes to protecting their customers that they don't switch from one bank to another one, then you have a lot of uh, problems which are not like a technical problem, which, which are like a business problem, basically. And um, that's why actually I, have, I, I think that blockchain technology is quite great, that you could use that as an, an underlinement for a, such a solution. But yeah, it will be interesting to see how it will develop. And I will allow a few comments from my side as well. Uh, we took approach that uh, Airbnb is doing for like past 10 years. So we do uh, identification of person on banking level because that's requirement by law from bank perspective to have understanding who is behind the account. And at the same time, we give customers possibilities to show as much information about themselves like social networks, like different uh, references from third parties, let's say LinkedIn. LinkedIn references are very good as one of examples that there is a lot of people knowing this person, so we're giving more trust that this person is genuine. And I would say that that's one of ways how like kind of official registry uh, or government hosted organization could work as well. That there is official part which is accessible by person and giving permission to show that data to public uh, information and there is like public information which is already there just combined in one, one solution. And then for the, the last word. <laughs> yep, about the e-identities. Uh, that There are really many different uh, projects, e-identity projects, but um, well except maybe uh, Estonian one, there is none like really, really good success story there. And the Estonian one, because uh, it made uh, mandatory by the government uh, for the every citizens in years ago. And, uh, and why there are no like success uh, stories there much is that they, every company wants to make his own standard, his own uh, identity platform and wants to control it. Uh, my belief into, into the future is that uh, really self-sovereign uh, e-identity solutions are the future decentralized e-identity solutions where the control of the identity information is uh, owned by the, by the identity owner itself, not any third party. And um, uh, the, the biggest um, project uh, and the more the far, forest project uh, is in that field uh, Ethereum-based U-port, which just a couple of days ago uh, came out uh, with a new uh, digital identity, um, open-sourced uh, decentralized digital identity standard. They have worked uh, with it like uh, over a couple of years already, and they have a uh, working application out there. And, uh, and yeah, it's totally... Uh, decentralized, controlled by the identity owner. Only question is uh, that uh, where is the starting point? And the, in the starting point, there needs to be a KYC process involved. But the platform itself can, can hold like um, identity information, which, is, which uh, isn't controlled by any government or third party organization. And I believe that's the future. Okay, so I think all the, the panelists and the audience have earned uh, coffee, so thank you to everybody, and we have a session still coming after the coffee break. <laughs>